Thank you for that fantastic uh, talk and a very um, innovative program. I'd love to be one of the students starting this summer. Um, so I'd like to um, introduce our uh, final speaker for this session, um, Dr. Jim Heath. I've been a big fan of uh, Jim's work since his really um, early fundamental work in, in nanoscience and um, molecular electronics, of which he won many prizes, including the Feynman um, Prize in, in nanostructures and nanotechnology. Um, he currently is uh, the president and professor of the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, and previously uh, he was uh, hold, held a chair in chemistry at Caltech and before that in chemistry at UCLA. He's founded and serves on the board of several companies, including Pact Pharma, Isoplexus, Indy Molecular, and uh, Sophie Biosciences, and he directs the National Cancer Institute um, Support uh, NSB Cancer Center. Um, today, he's going to talk about a molecular view of immuno-oncology. Up to minute changes? No, uh, just, a, yeah, kind of. Okay, well, thank you, and thank you for um, the introduction, Angie. It's a pleasure to be here. I was here, I think, at about six or seven years ago, back when, uh, and I talked about cancer immunotherapy back then, but back then it was sort of a backwater. It didn't, it didn't work. And um, obviously the world has changed a lot since then, um, but um, I want to give a little credit where credit's due when I start. So. A lot of the work I'm going to talk about, almost all of it, is with Tony Rivas, who's a medical doctor at UCLA, um, David Baltimore at Caltech, Bill Goddard at Caltech, and Chris Garcia um, at Stanford, and then several students, in particular Michael Bethune from uh, David's lab, uh, Jesse Zareski, not shown here, from Tony's lab, um, uh, uh, Leah Seibner from Garcia lab, and then Song Ming, Alphonse's fan, Juan June and William Chower from my lab. Okay, so Angie already covered my disclosures. All right, so I want to talk about, um, first talk, talk about a, a pretty amazing recent paper that came out. It wasn't our work. Um, this came out of the NIH group that um, most people associate with Steve Rosenberg, although it's, a, it's quite a large group. And what they did is that they, um, did a, a cell-based adopt-a-cell therapy transfer for metastatic breast cancer. And um, for those of you who have kept track of immunotherapy, um, metastatic breast cancer has not been a disease that has responded well to most immunotherapies. Um, and so here's a patient um, that um, you can, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I never, this is, I'm, it's too tricky. It's too tricky. There's a pointer here somewhere, too. Here we are. I'm OK. I, I know. Thank you. OK, so anyway, you can see that there is just all kinds of metastatic lesions in this patient. And, um, and what was done is that they identified, by a, almost a, a very brute force method, T cells that were residing in these tumors that reacted against tumor neoantigens, which are mutated antigens associated with the tumor, they expanded those T cells up and reinfused them into the patient. And then uh, 22 months later, um, the patient is in full remission with no detectable signs of cancer. Um, and you know, for metastatic breast, can breast cancer, this is just a staggering result. Now, this is basically how that therapy works. So you take a biopsy, uh, you separate these T cells, and doing a whole bunch of um, artificial, basically synthetic gene type of approaches, you identify which of those T cells get activated when they see one of these, uh, one of these mutated antigens presented on an um, uh, a antigen presenting cell on an MHC. And then, um, and then they, they separated those 
and expanded them in vitro and in, in, infused them back into the patient. So this is a, a powerful proof of principle, um, but it doesn't really scale. And, um, and it requires pretty careful patient selection. And so over the past five years or so, um, we've been working on an approach that, um, as close as we can imagine, scales this type of approach. It makes it more of a, uh, not quite a pill in a bottle, it never would be that, but, but something that is more close to what a CAR T cell type therapy is now. And so this is the steps that one has to go through. And I want to walk through this because they associated with this are a, a bunch of fundamental bioengineering challenges, basic science challenges, and also opportunities for um, really fundamental immunology discovery that I'll talk about as I get towards the end of this. So to do this, um, you want to, first you want to use the blood. And from the blood, you want to separate out the, the T cells. Um, you want to somehow identify those T cells in the blood that recognize tumor-associated antigens. Um, you want to match the T cell receptor genes with the um, neoantigen MHCs. Um, and then from the blood of a healthy patient, uh, and you want to, I think you want to do this because you get such highly variable qual quality of cells from cancer patients. Um, you want to take out these uh, same uh, T cells but then you want to edit out the endogenous T cell receptors and the MHC molecules. And the thought is that that would make this sort of an off-the-shelf T cell product. And then you want to engineer in um, tumor-reactive neoantigen-specific T cell receptors. And this tumor-reactive part is not the same thing as neoantigen-specific part. And I'll talk about that towards the end. And then you want to expand the optimized tumor-killing engineered T cells in vitro and reinfuse back into the cancer patient. And so I'll talk about a number of these challenges, but I'll just start off talking about uh, one, two, and, and three here. Um, so I think many folks are familiar with neoantigens. This is Boston. There's a lot of vaccine work that goes on here. Um, the reason why you want to do T cell, the whole reason you do neoantigen type vaccines is to get the T cells. So the T cells are one step closer. So you'll take the, the exome of the tumor and, and, and plus the transcriptome to find out what's expressed, and you'll identify um, proteins that contain mutations, somatic mutations. Um, you'll do some sort of uh, computational algorithm that finds out which of these fragments of these proteins that contain the mutations fit inside an MHC molecule, and you'll make a list. And this is for a particular HLA allele. Any given patient will have about six of these. And so this is a reasonably high mutation burden for a melanoma patient, but um, up to 500 nanomolar binding down to about 5 nanomolar binding. So you might end up with two or 300 or maybe even more potential neoantigens per patient. And now you want to find out in that patient from the blood which of those neoantigens are relevant. And, um, and you can just go through the math, but in about a milliliter of blood, um, if you're lucky, you'll get maybe five cells that are specific to any neoantigen. And those five cells are very likely to be polyclonal, so they're not going to have the same T cell receptor. So the gold standard method for doing this is a flow cytometry method that came out of Tone Shoemaker's group. And it uses, um, this is the, the peptide, the neoantigen is this little brown thing, um, MHC molecule that presents it on an antigen percentage cell. But you don't have the antigen percentage cell here. Instead, you just have a, um, a biotin. And so you assemble it onto a streptavid in the scaffold. You make a tetramer. And you do this because it increases the avidity. This is something that uh, Mark Davis from Stanford discovered a long time ago. And so you make two identical complexes, but one you label red, one you label green. And then the cells that sort out that have both red and green are the ones that you say are, um, are specific to that antigen. Now, it turns out it is not easy to quantitatively test this method for really, really rare cells in a realistic sample. And, um, and the, the, but recently, um, there's a paper, in fact, it's not even published yet in the official literature, but it's in BioArchive um, by Alex Marsden's group. I can guarantee you it works because we used it for the experiments I'll talk about. Um, the challenge is that you want to spike in tumor antigen-specific T cells into 
basically human PBMC is not into some model cell system. And you want to do it with a really well-known quantity of those cells. And, um, and, and CRISPR is great for knocking out genes, but it's not very good for knocking in genes. And there are other ways you can knock in genes, but they're relatively slow, so we want a fast method. And so Alex um, showed that in T cells, probably because they're dividing quickly, that one can use CRISPR to, to both knock out the endogenous T cell receptor, but knock in genes with an efficiency of you know, 25 to, to 50 or so percent. And so using that method, then you can take this, um, this uh, 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 two-color flow method, and you can spike in cells into just a, a, a healthy patient PBMC. And we call them Kokiko cells. My students thought this is because we somehow were getting them from Japan, but it's not. That's knockout, knock-in, knock-out for the alpha beta chain and the knock-in of the, of the new T cell receptor. And so this is a 33% ex expression, and you're capturing about half of those cells with a reasonable you know, uh, fidelity, but you're only capturing about half of the cells with this method. Um, so, this, so we developed an alternative method. It's very simple. It's, it's basically the same thing um, in terms of the basic reagents, but there's a nanoparticle involved. So this is the entire nanotech part of this talk, is this nanoparticle. And, and this nanoparticle, what it does, uh, you take this, you have make the stripped abdomen scaffold, but then on the nanoparticle, you can put about 100,000 of these tetramers on the nanoparticle surface, and so it gives you much higher avidity. And now when you take this, um, and you just pull them out with a, with a, uh, with a, a, a magnet, and, um, and you do a live cell stain and count the cells, and now you find that you actually capture basically every single one of the T cells you spiked in, uh, with a, 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 a significantly higher fidelity accuracy. And so this is enough um, to, to look in a healthy, pa in, in, a, in a cancer patient without a, a checkpoint inhibitor or without something that activated the immune system and identify cells. Or if it's not, then, um, it, then, then uh, but, but it turns out it is. And, and, and we have, we've done this on several patients now. So to do a whole library then, we take this uh, same nanoparticle we had before, same construct, but we put a DNA barcode, and so a DNA barcode corresponds to the neoantigen, and so we make this whole library of these, of these molecules. We don't do it this way anymore, but this way it does work. Um, and, and then so we have a, a neoantigen-specific nanoparticle that's barcoded um, with a DNA oligomer, and, um, and then you, you basically capture these cells for readout on a microfluidic chip. And, and you can see that this is basically, this is the live cell stain here, but this is uh, cells from a, a healthy patient blood. This is an accelerated movie, but just a little bit, like threefold. Um, but you're not missing a single cell. You're doing a, this is a great job at capturing the cells. And then you read them out. And you read them out by just uh, putting, uh, this is a three position barcode in this case. And so you put a fluorophore that will hybridize to this first position, which could be red, green, or yellow. In this case, it's red. You displace it so it goes dark. You read in the next position, displace, next position. Here's a cell where we've done yellow, red, green. Here's a list of 27 different antigens. I don't list the antigens, but this is the barcode for those antigens. And then yellow, red, green is this guy here. And so with this method, you can do 27. Or if you do four colors and four positions, you could do 256. Um, but this is about the type of library size that's manageable. If you have a big library of neoantigens, you just make a couple of, of, of these libraries um, to do this analysis. Okay, and so we did this. This is a pretty old data, but we've done this on many, many patients now. But I think it's still instructive because in this patient we had a kinetic series. And so this was a patient that we took the tumor exome back here at day zero this is an easy patient because it's a melanoma patient responding to anti-PD-1 therapy. But at day zero, um, uh, the therapy starts. We took blood samples where these arrows are pointing down. And we took another tumor biopsy where the arrow is pointing up. And what you can see is that basically you see the same populations um, at these different time points. At this little window here, where the tumors are actually growing after you give the therapy, it's called pseudoprogression. It's kind of common in immunotherapy. You actually find you have a very robust immune response 
um, that actually whittles out a little bit, but stays robust all the way through this process. But by the end here, there is nothing left that's detectable. Um, and then this is just the, the, the gene expression um, rate. And, and if you look at, these are the strongest binding antigens. And number 50 out here is a weak binding antigen to this MHC molecule. And so as your strong binding antigens, you know, you, you, you don't need, you need to have the genes expressed, but you don't need a lot of it. But as you go out here to these weaker binding ones, you do care about gene expression. OK, so that gives you part of the story. That tells you that you can actually see these cells. But you need to know the T cell receptor. And, um, and so this is a technology we developed to do this. So this is a, the microchip platform to do this. Here's barcoded T cells. And you can see they're dark because they're covered with nanoparticles. They're just floating up here. These are this sort of Avogadro's numbers of nanoparticles that don't find a T cell. And so they're tiny, so they're being separated by, this, by these posts here. And, um, and then, let me go back for a second. And then uh, uh, down here, they'll wander through this little pathway, and then they get introduced into this drop-seek platform. I think many people here are familiar with this because it was invented in this city. Uh, this is a little bit different of a drop-seek platform than the ones that are normally used. And, 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 and the, the difference is um, the following. So here's the nanoparticle and the big droplet of, of water, the cell that gets sliced when it gets into this droplet. The nanoparticle has these tetramers on it that capture it. But it also has oligomers on it that encode for both the alpha and the beta chain of the T cell receptor. But they also contain the neoantigen identity that is on this tetramer here. And the point being that um, when we do the RT-PCR, we'll actually get both the alpha and the beta chain, but we'll also have that antigen identity. But you have to do the first 35 cycles or so of RT-PCR in the little droplets. And that's a non-trivial thing to heat these droplets up to 95 degrees centigrade that many times, but you can do it. And, um, and so this is a comparison of, of doing that um, drop seek with a, a method that was a flow cytometry method that came out of Mark Davis's group. And this is CMV specific antigens, the viral antigen. And these are the, I, I just give you labels to show the ones in red are the ones that are seen in both methods. We see a few more in the drop pair seek, but basically the dominant ones we see here are the same ones that are seen in this method here. And so it seems like a valid method. And it does give you, you can make it parallel. I'm not going to talk about that data, but you can do this in parallel. I'm going to uh, talk about a different challenge that comes about. So here, we've taken um, uh, patient blood, and we've looked for T cells that are specific to what's called the MART1 antigen, which is, it's, it's, a, it's an immunogenic antigen associated with melanoma. Um, but, but you'll see it in healthy patients. Uh, you'll see responses in healthy patients to this. And, um, and so we've gotten, um, uh, uh, these are alpha chains on top. These are a, a, a beta chains on the bottom. But the numbers index the same single cell. And when you sequence these, you find that you've got a huge polyclonality. There's a certain amount that we don't know if it's noise or not. But um, basically, almost all of these are different clones. And so if we're going to engineer a T cell receptor, to be a therapeutic T cell receptor, which clone do you pick? It's not an obvious, it's not an obvious um, uh, choice. Um, and so this leads us to the question of if you have a specific T cell receptor that recognizes an antigen MHC complex, is that T cell receptor antigen MHC interaction going to be an agonist one? Or is it just going to be an interaction that doesn't lead to a T cell activation? And, um, and so this is a project now that we learned, uh, we, we, we stepped in midway through it um, on a project that was ongoing in Chris Garcia's lab. Uh, Leo Seibner was his lead student. Um, and, and, um, and, I'll, and then we've got Bill Goddard and, and my postdoc, Fan Liu, involved. And, um, and the reason why this is not obvious is that the the TCR peptide MAC interaction is, I think it's a paradox. Because normally one thinks of weak interactions as being non 
nonspecific. There are basically lots of things in Iraq weekly. And, um, and in fact, if you look at this interaction, it's very weak. It's about the strength of one or two water hydrogen bonds. About one micromolar is a pretty strong one. Um, and, and so how do you have such a weak interaction and it can be so very, very selective? And that is the beauty of the immune system is that it is very selective. And there's been a lot of literature on this. And, um, and so this is not, we're not the first people to realize that this is a, 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 a paradox. And so there's people that talk about kinetic um, arguments. There's um, affinity arguments. Here's one that says it's only affinity, not dissociation rate. Here it is clearly about dissociation rate, dissociation rate, confinement time. Um, so there's a lot of papers on this, a lot of data, but there's no mechanistic information on what leads to an agonist behavior. Um, and what Chris and his collaborators had found, um, and here's three T cell receptors. So, they, so this is the, it's the same T cell receptor, it's the same MHC, but it's three different antigens. And, and so this is a, a weak binder that's an agonist. And, um, and this is a strong binder that's an agonist. This is one that would be sort of a textbook example. This would be a textbook exception. And this is a weak binder non-agonist, and this would be sort of a, 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 a textbook example as well. And, and what they did is that they applied a force to a, a cells presenting each one of these two pairs. And they found that when they applied the force that these paired, that this interaction lives longer. And that's opposite of what you think of a chemical bond. You think of a chemical bond as you apply a force that actually ought to start breaking the bond and the bond should be less. And so the, the picture that developed is what's called a catch bond. And, and it's called that because it's as if you've got a fish hook embedded and as you jiggle it, that fish gets caught and it tends to, um, to, to lead that lifetime longer. Um, so it's not a, a mechanistic insight, but it's at least a biophysical insight. And so we, um, uh, so this is the, when we heard about this, and then um, and we decided we thought this was something that we could probably add some mechanistic insight into. And so I, I, I got this postdoc, and we started working with Bill Goddard. And and when you work with Bill, that means you get to have teleconferences with Bill at 6 a.m. on Sundays. It's great for the family life. Um, so, so this is the size of the simulation we do. So this is water is all the red stuff. This is the um, MHC molecule. There's an antigen in here somewhere. This is the T cell receptor alpha beta chain. And then we're worrying about the details of these, of these interactions right here, which are largely just hydrogen bonds or salt bridges or what have you. OK, so now watch this. This is the dissociation. So let me, let me just go back a second and, and, and explain what we're, what we're doing in this, in this movie. Um, so when you have a, when you want to break a bond, it's the, kind of like breaking a pencil. If you break a pencil, you don't hold on to the lead in the eraser and pull it. You never break it that way. You actually just snap it. You shear it. And everything breaks by shear. And this is no exception. And so what we're doing is that we're going to shear this along one of the axes. And so just stare at, say, this interaction, one of these H-bond uh, interactions right here, as we shear this this T cell receptor across this MHC peptide interface. And as the shears look at it, that bond broke, but now it makes another one. And that's the case for every single one of these interactions. Uh, I don't know if you, if you saw it, but there's this one that had broken that just made, and so on and so forth. And so it turns out no matter what direction you shear this in, that's what happens for this particular agonist interaction. You shear it, and it's as if the surface of the peptide MHC is a two-dimensional barcode. And as soon as you break some of these interactions, there's another position where you make them. And it doesn't matter if you shear an X or minus X or Y or minus Y. And I think, we don't know yet, but I think that is why you get such specificity out of this weak interaction. It's a, these interactions don't make it a stronger interaction. They make it live longer and they give you a higher specificity. And so here's these, these bonds 
that are made initially, they break. Here's another one that it makes in, uh, as this one breaks, and, and so on and so forth. And so here's these three cases. So this is the non-agonist case, this HIV. And no matter how you break it, you make zero catch bonds. And then here's these two agonist case cases, this PEP20 and this SQL peptide. This is the, the SQL is the exception. The PEP20 is one that you would expect. And um, no matter how you shear it, whatever direction you go, um, you will, um, you'll make these catch bonds. And if you do try to pull it apart with, by tensile, it'll just shear, because it's too hard to pull apart by, by tensile strength. And I think something really interesting is that the difference between this non-agonist and this agonist antigen is a methylene group. It's almost nothing. And here's the substitution here. Um, it's just, this is this amino acid this valine, a substitute of this isoleucine, this additional methyl group. And all that does is it basically adds a steric restraint that causes these cash bonds from not to, to not form. It just, it just makes, the, makes it too bulky there. So how am I? Oh, I'm, I'm pretty much done. OK. So, um, so a question that's, that's asked is, can we actually produce a statistical algorithm instead of doing these sort of light dimming molecular dynamics calculations to predict what are going to be agonist T cell receptors? And, um, and, and can we, um, and, and, re, and the preliminary results kind of say yes, and that's because my, my postdoc fan seems like he does have the ability to do this prediction. He hasn't told us what he's looking at when he does this, so we don't really understand that yet. But we're trying to get it to be a little more standardized so that Jim also can figure this out. Um, and, and we're trying to also develop uh, uh, experimental and, and computational approaches that just lower the cost of making bad guesses as, good, and, as well as good guesses so that we can just from sequencing information figure out what the agonists um, are going to be and what the non-agonist T cell receptors are going to be. Um, and more generally, you know, the immune system is full of these types of interactions. B cells tend to be strong interactions, but largely these other ones are weak. And we have some evidence that CD4 T cells are the same. They also have this similar, similar physics associated with them. Um, CD4 T cell antigens are much more complicated than CD8, um, but it doesn't seem like it's an insurmountable problem. Um, but, you know, is it possible to sort through all this? Um, and then, you know, I, I think also, you know, we've talked a little bit here about the technologies that are coming out of all the various things we've talked about at this Clock Cancer Institute Symposium. But obviously, the more you learn about the immune system in this way, the more you can think about how to apply it to other disease um, conditions, identify elite responders, people that go to chronic. Maybe it has to do with these types of, of molecular interactions. And uh, finally, this is my, my group. As soon as we get a sunny day in Seattle, we'll take a picture in Seattle, but this is in, this is in California still. Um, my son, John, was in my group at the time. He raided my closet and stole all my Hawaiian shirts. And so my, my group and some people, we had plenty of Hawaiian shirts for everybody. Some people refused to wear them. And so they're listed down here on the bottom, but, um, but everybody else is up here. Um, Song Ming is the guy who really pioneered most of the stuff I talked about. Um, and then along with um, Alphonsus and, and William and, 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 and John, actually, and, and Alex um, have developed a lot of these, um, these methods. And then uh, Fan Lu also did the, did the uh, theory. And with that, thank you very much. <laughs>